somehow or another we connected and have grown a friendship over yeah. the years. And your wife and my wife. Yeah, they love each other, that's for sure. Yeah. Let's fast forward to those 16 Tuesdays mm. because you have writing that deals with death and dying, what it means, and life after death. You deal with all of that and that cycle. So you see Ted Koppel talking to your old professor. Right. What made you get back in touch? Guilt. Was he surprised to hear from you? When I was in college, I used to call Maury coach. That was like a sports affectation. And I, by the time 16 years had passed, I'd totally forgotten that. So when I saw him on Nightline, I looked up his number. It was still listed. I dialed it. Um, a nurse answered. I asked for him. She hands you hear the phone like kind of being dropped or whatever. And then he picks up, hello. And the first thing out of my mouth was, Professor Schwartz, my name is Mitch Album. I was a student of yours in the 70s. I don't know if you remember me. The first thing out of his mouth was, how come you didn't call me coach? So needless to say, by the end of that conversation, I was going to visit him because guilt is a very powerful motivator, Phil. And, uh, you know, so what I thought would be a one-time phone call, then I thought, well, I'll go visit him and it'll be a one-time visit. And, uh, you know, even in the driving there, and again, I want to tell people I was, it was not magnanimous. I was, I was thinking I'll be here for one, uh, you know, I was looking at my watch. And when I rented the car, back in those days, people didn't have cell phones, but you could rent them. And I rented a car with a cell phone so I could talk to ESPN. And while I drove into Maury's neighborhood, and it was a warm day, I remember, and he had his nurses carry him out in the wheelchair to wait for me unbeknownst to me, because he wanted to greet me like right at the curb, you know, and I come driving down the street. I'm on the phone with ESPN talking about something or another that couldn't possibly matter now. And I see him kind of up ahead and I hit the brakes. And of course, the proper thing to do would be to throw the cell phone out the window and run out and give him a hug. Right. And I'd like to say that that's what I did. I would like to say that that's what I did, but I did not. What I did was stop the car and slide down under the <laughs> dashboard, making like I was looking for my keys. And I laid on the floor of that rental car for three or four minutes, finishing that conversation with ESPN. Because at that point in my life, you know, work came first and everything else could wait, even a dying old man. So before anybody gives me any compliments about Tuesdays with Maury, that's who I was when I first went to see him. Right. You did pull up eventually after you let him <laughs> cook in the sun. <laughs> Yeah, he was cooking in the sun. He was in a wheelchair. And I went in and I saw him. Um, and I was so taken, Phil, in that meeting. It was like going back in time. I always say this to people about, you know, if you had a really good teacher in your life, anytime you see them again, you become a pupil and they're your teacher. You're like sitting in a little desk all of a sudden. I don't care if you're 60 years old. You see your kindergarten teacher and you're 60. You are back in that little desk and they are your teacher, Miss Whatever or Mr. Whatever. And I went back to sort of, but sitting with him, I, I was like transported back to being a student. And I guess in hindsight, I was a better person when I was a student. You know, I hadn't had all this ambition. I hadn't done all this chasing of accomplishments and things. And I liked myself when I was sitting with him. And he, he didn't know this new me. He just knew the old college version of me. And he never asked about how much money I made. He never asked about my job. He just asked like, are you happy with your life? Have you found somebody who you can share your life with? Are you involved with your community? And by the time this visit was over, which was supposed to be one hour and it went on for like four hours, I flew home that night and I said, you know, you're 37 years old, you're perfectly healthy. He's 78 years old and dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. And he seems 10 times happier and more content with his life than you are. And there's something the matter with this picture. And that's why I began to go back the next Tuesday, next Tuesday, all the Tuesdays that he had left in his life, I was really trying to get the answer to, you know, what do we realize when we're looking death in the face, really looking at, not the abstract death, but I'm going to be dead in six months kind of thing that really puts everything into perspective. And we were able to do like this last class together where every week we would bring up like one topic, uh, marriage, forgiveness, money, career, you know, and, and he would talk about it through the eyes of someone who was very close to death. And he would say, this matters. 
this doesn't matter. You think this matters, but when you get to where I am, and he would always stop and say, and you will get to where I am, you know, it's not going to matter. And that's what that great last class was about, you know, and uh, I was absolutely blessed to have that experience and to think that he only had months left and he gave me every Tuesday. That's a remarkable act of generosity.